Good morning, friends. Welcome to our uh, first meeting of the fall session uh, here in the Washington, D.C. area. We meet at 4865A Cordell Avenue, but there's a uh, every Sunday at 11 o'clock, usually for a presentation. This being the first Sunday of the month, and we have an afternoon uh, round table as well, and we do that every first and third Sunday of the month. Uh, today's talk on the three fundamentals will be uh, followed by um, a, a discussion on the three objects as well and a question and answer period after that part. We follow the Declaration of the United Lodge of Theosophists, which was established in 1909 uh, by Robert Crosby to, to bring the teachings back to, to the original as, uh, as laid out uh, by William H. V. V. and William Q. Judge, uh, who were messengers of the Masters of Wisdom. The policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement, but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps in view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of the philosophy of theosophy and the exemplification and practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, is similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution, bylaws, nor officers. The sole bond between its associates being that basis, and it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition, or organization. And it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophist belongs to no cult or sect, yet belongs to each and all. The following is a form signed by associates of the United Lodge of Theosophists. Being in sympathy with the purposes of this lodge as set forth in its declaration I hereby record my desire to be enrolled as an associate, it being understood that such association calls for no obligation on my part other than that which I myself determine. We're going to have a reading from the voice of the silence, and then we'll have the discussion on the three fundamentals following that. The voice of the silence, fragment one. These instructions are for those ignorant of the dangers of the lower ED. He who would hear the voice of Nada, the soundless sound, and comprehend it, he has to learn the nature of Dharana. Having become indifferent to objects of perception, the pupil must seek out the Raja of the senses, the thought producer, he who awakes illusion. The mind is the great slayer of the real. Let the disciple slay the slayer. For when to himself his form appears unreal, as do on waking all the forms he sees in dreams, when he has ceased to hear the many, he may discern the one. 
the inner sound which kills the outer. Then only, not till then, shall he forsake the region of Asat, the false, to come unto the realm of Sat, the true. Before the soul can see, the harmony within must be obtained, and fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion. Before the soul can hear, the image, man, has to become as deaf to roarings as to whispers, to cries of bellowing elephants as to the silvery buzzing of the golden firefly. Before the soul can comprehend and may remember, she must unto the silent speaker be united, just as the form to which the clay is modeled is first united with the potter's mind. For then the soul will hear and will remember, and then to the inner ear will speak the voice of the silence. And now our top, the three fundamental. <coughs> Hello, good morning, friends, welcome. The three fundamental propositions of theosophy may be regarded as postulates for individual use and study of the three most important and comprehensive philosophical questions which exist. What is the origin of man? What are the laws and processes of interaction between the whole or the universe and that part which is man? Is it justice or a cosmic fact? Is the individual man immortal as an individual? And if so, what should be his conscious purpose in selecting and weighing life's experiences? What goal may be reached? Every religion or philosophy is based in this last analysis upon attempted answers to these three questions. More important, the thought and action of each individual are profoundly influenced by his opinions concerning them. Thoughts are things. Whether consciously adopted or unconsciously absorbed from church background or general environment, this is not to say that every thoughtful man must, be, must employ the terms of intellectual philosophy, nor that he has to be identified by his ability to state the fundamental questions in just the way above suggested. The actual question usually first asked, which bears a clear relationship to the fundamentals, is one occasioned by intense suffering, less frequently by intense joy. Why does this happen to me? For the personal consciousness of the individual man, the essential elements of human experience are simply happiness and suffering. Yet when man seeks to understand these states, which he alternately passes through, when he arrives to find some measure of control over them, he needs perspective and orientation, basic orientation. Here he arrives at the doorway of the great impersonal fundamental questions and is driven to find answers complete enough to provide at least a temporary working basis for integration. Fundamentals may be considered to be realities, not intellectual phrasings, Yet it is through the natural disciplines of the reflective mind that one can expand this perception of the reality within himself and the world around him. Through philosophy of itself, but a means to the end of intelligent, right, and satisfying action, it is an all-important means. It is through the medium of self-conscious mind that the human evolution proceeds formulation of the great universal principles which inhere in life carries with it the essence of theosophical intent to help individual men to find greater measure of conscious control over their own inner lives. As Madame Blavatsky puts in the transactions of the Blavatsky Lodge, apparently the whole basis of occultism lies in this, that there is latent within every man a power which can give him true knowledge a power of perception of truth, which enables him to deal firsthand with universals, if he will be strictly logical and face the facts. Thus we can proceed from universals to particulars, 
by this innate spiritual force which is in every man. As you sow, so shall you reap. Now I will turn my focus to the secret doctrine. The secret doctrine establishes three fundamental propositions. An omnipresent, eternal, boundless, and immutable principle on which all speculation is impossible since it transcends the power of human conception and could only be dwarfed by any human expression or similitude. It is beyond the range and reach of thought, in the words of Mandukya, unthinkable and unspeakable. To render these ideas clear to the general reader, let him set out with the postulate that there is one absolute reality which antecedes all manifested conditioned being. This infinite and eternal cause dimly formulated in the unconscious and unknowable of current European philosophy is the rootless root of all that was, is, or ever shall be. It is, of course, devoid of all attributes and is essentially without any relationship to manifested finite being. It is the be-ness rather than being. In Sanskrit, sat. It is beyond all thought or speculation. It is the manifested logos. It is pure white light. And pure white light, of course, has the whole spectrum of all the colors. This beingness is symbolized in the secret doctrine under two aspects. On the one hand, absolute abstract space representing bare subjectivity the one thing which no human mind can either exclude from any conception or conceive of by itself. On the other, absolute abstract motion representing unconditioned consciousness. Even our Western thinkers have shown that consciousness is inconceivable to us apart from change, and motion thus symbolizes change, its essential characteristic. This latter aspect of the one reality is also symbolized by the term the great breath, a symbol sufficiently graphic to need no further elucidation. Thus then, the fundamental axiom of the secret doctrine is this metaphysical one absolute beingness, symbolized by finite intelligence as the theological trinity. It may, however, assist the student if a few further explanations are given here. Herbert Spencer has of late so far modified his agnosticism as to assert that the nature of the first cause, which the occultist more logically derives as the causeless cause, the eternal and the unknowable, may be essentially the same as the consciousness which wells up within us, as I am I. In short, that the impersonal reality pervading the cosmos is the pure noumenon of thought. This advance on his part brings him very near to the esoteric and Vedantin tenet. Padabram, the one reality, the absolute, is the field of absolute consciousness, that essence which is out of all relation to conditioned existence, and of which conscious existence is a conditioned symbol. But once that we pass in thought from this to us, absolute negation, duality supervenes in the contrast of spirit, or consciousness, and matter, subject, and object. Spirit or consciousness and matter are, however, to be regarded not as independent realities, but as two facets or aspects of the absolute Padabram, which constitute the basis of conditioned being whether subjective or objective. Considering this metaphysical triad as the root from which proceeds all manifestation, the great breath assumes the character of precosmic ideation. It is the fons et origo of force and all individual consciousness, and supplies the guiding intelligence in the vast scheme of cosmic evolution. On the other hand, precosmic root substance, mula prakriti, is that aspect of the absolute which underlies all the objective planes of nature.
Just as the precosmic ideation is the root of all individual consciousness, so precosmic substance is the substratum of matter in the various grades of its differentiation. Hence it will be apparent that the contrast of these two aspects of the Absolute is essential to the existence of the manifested universe. Apart from cosmic substance, cosmic ideation could not manifest as individual consciousness, since it is only through a vehicle of matter that consciousness wells up as I am I. A physical basis being necessary to focus a ray of the universal mind at a certain stage of complexity. Again, apart from the cosmic ideation, cosmic substance would remain an empty abstraction and no emergence of consciousness could ensue. The manifested universe, therefore, is pervaded by duality, which is, as it were, the very essence of its existence as manifestation. But just as the opposite poles of subject and object, spirit and matter, are but aspects of the one unity which they are synthesized, so in the manifested universe there is that which links spirit to matter, subject to object. This something at present, unknown to Western speculation, is called by occultist Fohat. It is the bridge by which the ideas existing in the divine thought are impressed on cosmic substance, as the laws of nature. Fohat is thus the dynamic energy of cosmic ideation, or regarded from the other side, it is the intelligent medium, the guiding power of all manifestation, the thought divine, transmitted and made manifest through the Dion Chohans, or Archangels, the architects of the visible world. Thus from spirit to cosmic ideation comes our consciousness, from cosmic substance, the several vehicles in which that consciousness is individualized and attains to self or a reflective consciousness, while Fohat in its various manifestations is the mysterious link between mind and matter, the animating principle electrifying every atom into life. The following summary will afford a clear idea to the reader. The absolute, the Parabrahm, of the Vedantins, or the one reality, Sat, which is, as Hegel says, both absolute being and non-being. The first manifestation, the impersonal, and in philosophy, unmanifested logos, divine speech, the precursor of the manifested. This is the first cause, the unconscious of European pantheists. Spirit matter, life, the spirit of the universe, the Purusha and the Prakriti, or the second Logos. Cosmic ideation, Mahat, or intelligence, the universal world soul, the cosmic noumenon of matter, the basis of the intelligent operations in and of nature, also called Mahabuddhi. The one reality, its dual aspects in the conditioned universe. Further, the secret doctrine affirms, the eternity of the universe in toto, as a boundless plane, periodically the playground of numberless universes, incessantly manifesting and disappearing, called the manifesting stars and the sparks of eternity. This book is groundbreaking in that it foresaw modern physics. The eternity of the pilgrim is like the wink of the eye of self-existence. The appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. This second assertion of the secret doctrine is the absolute universality of that law of periodicity, of flux and reflux, ebb and flow, which physical science has observed and recorded in all departments of nature. An alternation of such that of day and night, life and death, sleeping and waking, a fact so common, so perfectly universal and without exception, that it is easy to comprehend that in it we see one of the absolute fundamental laws of the universe. 
Moreover, the secret doctrine teaches the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root, and the obligatory pilgrimage of every soul, a spark of the former through the cycle of incarnation. In accordance with cyclic and karmic law during the whole term, and in other words, no purely spiritual booty, divine soul, can have independent conscious existence before the spark which issued from the pure essence of the universal sixth principle, or the oversoul, has passed through every elemental form of the phenomenal world of that manvantara, and acquired individuality, first by natural impulse, and then by self-induced and self-devised efforts, checked by its karma. Thus ascending through all the degrees of intelligence, from the lowest to the highest manas, from mineral to plant, up to the holiest archangel, Dion Buddha. The pivotal doctrine of the esoteric philosophy admits no privileges or special gifts in man, save those won by his own ego through personal effort and merit through a long series of metempsychoses and reincarnations. This is why the Hindus say that the universe is Brahma, and Brahma, or Brahma, is in every atom of the universe, the six principles of nature all being the outcome, the variously differentiated aspects of the seventh and one, the only reality in the universe, whether cosmical or microcosmical, and also why the permutations, psychic, spiritual, and physical, on the plane of manifestation and form, of the sixth Brahma, the vehicle of Brahma, are viewed by metaphysical antiphrasis as elusive and myopic. For although the root of every atom individually and of every form collectively is that seventh principle or the one reality, still in its manifested phenomenal and temporary appearance it is no better than an evanescent illusion of our senses. In its absoluteness, the one principle, under its two aspects of Parabrahma and Mula Prakriti, is sexless, unconditioned, and eternal. Its periodical manvantaric emanation, or primal radiation, is also one androgynous and phenomenally finite. When the radiation radiates in its turn, all its radiations are also androgynous, to become male and female principles in their lower aspects. After pralaya, whether the great whether the great or the minor pralaya, the latter leaving the world in status quo, the first that reawakens to active life is the plastic akasha, father, mother, and spirit, and soul of ether on the plane of the surface of the circle. Space is called the mother. Before its cosmic activity and father, mother at the first stage of reawakening, in the Kabbalah, it is also father, mother, son. But whereas in Eastern doctrine, these are the seventh principle of the manifested universe, or its Atma Bodhi Manas, or spirit, soul, intelligence, the triad branching off and dividing into the seven cosmical and seven human principles in the Western Kabbalah of the Christian mystics, it is the triad or trinity. And with their occultists, the male, female, Jehovah, Jahava. In this lies the whole difference between esoteric and the Christian trinities. The mystics and philosophers, the Eastern and Western pantheists, synthesize their pregenetic triad in the pure divination of abstraction. The Orthodox anthropomorphizes it. The three hypotheses of the manifesting spirit of the Supreme Spirit, 
by which the Priviti and Earth greets Vishnu in its first avatar are the purely metaphysical abstract qualities of formation, preservation, and destruction, and are the three divine avasthas of that which does not perish with created things. Whereas the Orthodox Christian separates his personal creative deity into three personages of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and admits no higher deity, the latter in occultism is the abstract triangle, with the orthodox the perfect cube. The creative god or the aggregate gods are regarded by the Eastern philosopher as false apprehension. Something conceived of by reason of erroneous appearances as a material form and explained as arising from the elusive conception of the egotistic, personal, and human soul, lower fifth principle. It is beautifully expressed in a new translation of Vishnu Purana, that Brahma is in totality as essentially the aspect of Prakriti, both evolved and unevolved, Mula Prakriti, and also the aspect of spirit and the aspect of time, which is the event horizon for our being, or Sat. Spirit, O twice born, is the leading aspect of the supreme Brahma. The next is a twofold aspect, Prakriti, both evolved and unevolved, and is the last, and is the time last. Kronos is shown in the Orphic theogony as being also a generated god or agent. At this stage of the reawakening of the universe, the sacred symbolism represents it as a perfect circle with the root point in the center. This sign was universal, therefore we find it in the Kabbalah also. The Western Kabbalah, however, now in the hands of the Christian mystics, ignores it altogether, though it is plainly shown in the Zohar. These sectarians begin at the end and show the symbol of pregenetic cosmos this sign. Calling it the union of the rose and cross. The great mystery of the occult generation from whence the name Rosicrucians. The rose arises from within the cross. As may be judged, however, from the most important, as the best known Rosicrucian symbols, there is one which has never been now understood, even by modern mystics. It is that of the pelican, tearing open its breast to feed its seven little ones, the real creed of the brothers of the Rose Cross, and direct outcome from the Eastern secret doctrine. Brahma is called Kalahansa, meaning, as explained by Western Orientalists, the eternal swan, or goose. And, and so is Brahma, the creator. A great mistake is thus brought under notice. It is Brahma who ought to be referred to as Hansa Vahana. He who uses the swan as his vehicle, and not Brahma, the creator, who is the real Kalahansa, while Brahma is Hamsa and Ahamsa, as will be explained in the commentary. Let it be understood that by the terms Brahma and Parabrahm are not used here because they belong to our esoteric nomenclature, but simply because they are more familiar to the students in the West. Both are the perfect equivalents of our one, three, and seven vowel terms, which stand for the one all and the one all in all. Such are the basic conceptions on which the secret doctrine rests. It would, be, it would not be in place here to enter upon any defense or proof of their inherent reasonableness, nor can I pause to show how they are. In fact, contained, though, too often under a misleading guise in every system of thought or philosophy worthy of the name. Once that the reader has gained a clear comprehension of them and realized the light which they throw on every problem of life, 
they will need no further justification in his eyes because their truth will be to him as evident as the sun in heaven. I pass on, therefore, to the subject matter of the stanzas as given in this volume, adding a skeleton outline of them in the hope of thereby rendering the task of the student more easy, but placing before him in a few words the general conception therein explained. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. So what you're doing is you, you laid out the whole fundamental basis for the sacred doctrine, really for life itself, and, and the evolutionary process, karma reincarnation, yes. all that in a few pages in, in the sacred doctrine. This book for and it's also tied in directly. Science. I'm looking at the objects of the Theosophical movement and the whole basis for that to form the nucleus of the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, and so forth. Universal brotherhood uh, is clearly important and is uh, discussed in virtually every religion. Yes. Uh, and yet we don't seem to understand it well. The yes. second thing we study, are, study we, are divided divided by, we, are, we are divided by our identity politics. Exactly. If we looked further into the secret doctrine, we'd realize that we are all one human race and ancestors of subsequent sub races. Yes, you got it. The study of uh, ancient and modern religions it talks about, you, you mentioned uh, uh, that, and the reason why we do that is that to get that common basis and understand that common basis uh, and how it fits in with this because really this is the fundamental basis for all religions. Yes. Science and philosophy. And the third, the investigation of the unexplained laws of nature. Well, um, you know, we can see how, we can look at out the window in the morning and realize, hey, we're, we're in cycles because of daylight, dark, and so forth. Yes. And there's a lot of things that happen in the process, and the more we dwell on the simple things, the more we come to realize are the more complicated things. And it's uh, cyclical power of letting in man. I just want to kind of summarize those from the objects. Uh, I don't Thank think you. I have any, I, mean, I have lots of questions, but someone else raised their hand, so I'll do it before. Yeah, uh, the comment was. Um, you read um, in the commentary that um, there is Kalahansa, uh, which is not in time and uh, space, but that when it does become in time and space, then our manifested world comes about, which you represented as the circle. Now, in the secret doctrine, we are told that that circle does not have a circumference when we think about it universally. Hmm. But to make it understood to the human mind, we have to put one on there. So hmm. when we sit at meditation, I think one of the objectives is to open that circle as far and wide as we can. Yes. That one, yeah. It's not an easy thing to do, but um, Mr. Judge has practical suggestions for us, and he says that the best thing to do is do it like a spiral from the center that you are at, and include your community where you are, mm. and then expand it to your nation, and to the world, and then to the whole solar system. Um, there's yes. an article uh, about his life where it says that he some, somehow you could see that he was circling a larger one, Mr. Judd, in his life. So mm -hmm. he had transcended that aspect of it, obviously. Yes, he so was a master us, meditator and yogi. We're trying, but it's not an easy concept to achieve. So um, perhaps you would explain uh, by writing the names up there, because Brahma and Brahma one is pre-cosmic uh, and the other one is in time and place. 
and they're normally reversed in all the literature of the world, and she puts it right in the beginning of the secret doctrine. One has an accent growl on it, and the other one does not. The fundamental teaching of the secret doctrine is that we are all one and made of one substance and that we can communicate to each other through logos, our divine speech, and as long as we as long as we hold ourselves to a high standard, we can speak the truth or at least not lie. Any more questions? You said seek the truth. So but what we're learning, what we're seeing in this world is relative truth. So as we learn more well, about the yes. truth, we are we're moving to higher planes. This that phenomenal that world is Maya. It? it is illusion. We have to look beyond it. Hmm. But at the same time, for all of us that live in it, it's real enough because this is where we grow. This is where we experience life. This is how we add uh, to the um, to total knowledge uh, or comparative knowledge that we have assimilated. Any other way is not possible until our consciousness is such that we are united with the all. This is a struggle for all humanity yes, to we find are. the truth. and. The motto of, of that uh, philosophy is there is no higher religion than truth. Yes. So she says, though, that that book, even though it is very large, it's a very small portion of the Eastern secret doctrine in the possession of the Master's Lodge, that they just lifted the, the page a little bit. Yes. And depending how it would be received in the world, further uh, stuff would be sent out and it was not sent out she didn't even release the last two she wrote because of the um, treatment Slander. that they, they yeah. received it was fought in all quarters of the universe and they tried to um, slander the messenger who brought the message into the world trying to make it go away but obviously it will not go away and hopefully more people are attracted to the philosophy and our numbers in time will increase. The difficulty I think is that each human mind understands it according to where it's at. Yes. And so that's where the disparity comes between all those students all over the world because sometimes they don't agree on things. Well, I think that's healthy, that, that comparative uh, discussion as to what it is is very healthy. Yes, I think it contributes to critical thinking on the subject matters. Yeah. But yes. it is also important. Josh. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask about, you mentioned when talking about um, absolute abstract space and absolute abstract motion, you talk about um, consciousness can't really be understood except in the context of change. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? What you mean by yes, that? Um, abstract motion and abstract space are fundamentally feminine in their nature. And the masculine nature is more like a rock. So consciousness is an interplay between masculine and feminine. That's my understanding. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, this student was um, a guest at the TS, and they were studying from a book where they have changed all of the words in the book that mention motion into change. But you said, and I brought it to their attention on that day, that motion cannot be replaced by change because change comes about as a result of motion. If we did not have any movement, no change would occur. In a Newtonian sense, yes. But when you're talking about abstract space and abstract motion, 
it cannot be understood by the limited conception of the human mind. She's talking here of the universe in its totality. And she says that concept cannot be understood by the human mind because it's inclusive of everything. How are you going to understand it before comparativeness comes into it? In the manifested universe, there is that positive, negative, uh, in our words, uh, contrast. That's how we learn. But when you're talking about the totality, it's not there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what perhaps uh, the student in the back is referring to. Absolute consciousness that permeates all yeah. manifested being. It, it, it doesn't. It isn't subject to motion. That absolute consciousness. Yes, it is stillness. Yeah. And absolute consciousness always is, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It always. It's is. that awareness mm -hmm. that it always is. With respect to that, in the I am I. <coughs> yes. We are. Th we are dual in our nature as we are embodied. We have that higher mind and that lower mind. We, one which is the observer the student understands, and the other which is changing all the time. So we are part of that all in, in our uh, constitution, when you're thinking about the spiritual side of the two. Yes, so we're in a vehicle of matter in which the consciousness I am I can manifest but we don't have to identify completely with our bodies because we are eternal souls yes, I, love, I love to use the word vehicle there uh, because it implies motion right mm -hmm. right if, if you just got into a thing and it didn't go anywhere you'd never even think of the word vehicle well, that's a great point vehicle of matter means it's moving it's going somewhere mm-hmm Vehicle matter. It's interesting. Yeah. It's <laughs> a great point. But at the same time, the lower aspects are not real in themselves because if you're the Trinity, then how would you define the lower quaternary? You need it to be here on Earth, but it's not real, it's phenomenal. It's a bag of characteristics. And yes. when you drop it, the real essence of each human soul then presents itself, which is the Trinity Atma Bhajimana. But in the Western uh, psychological system, that is not there. No, because for the human mind to understand, it needs to be made human and understandable for modern humans. But, but if you base your psychology on a concept that is not real, it's a social the division construct. of the human uh, constitution, then how are you going to assign uh, concepts to each sheaf that you are not even aware of exists? And that is why I think we need to go to the East and learn from them a little bit yes. in that regard. Because if we don't know what sheaf uh, is, first of all, names do not, do not uh, give suggestions as to what they really are, but even that is missing from the uh, Western psychology. And if you do not know where your passions reside, how your mind works, uh, how you're responsible for everything that you do, think, and say, then what value our psychology has? It really baffles this student. Yes. So you were talking about, um, or, or you mentioned, I think, in a quote, Western philosophy um, doesn't have the concept of uh, a noumenon and a phenomenon, or, or uh, um, you know, a, an absolute and a manifest. Um, but the students um, think it turns to Plato and Plato's cave. Yes. Um, and there does seem to be a pretty strong parallel there to um, this distinction between sort of archetypal platonic truth versus what's being witnessed as the shadows on the cave. Yes. Um, and, uh, and that seems pretty fundamentally Western in terms of uh, a philosophical uh, school. Um, it, it, would it be more precise to say that it's just missing from the Judeo-Christian philosophy 
um, versus, uh, I mean, if we, if we include the Greeks within the concept of Western philosophy, it seems like it, it is there. You could, you could think about and tie in together both of your comments. Plato's cave is the modern movie theater, and our masters, the so-called leaders of society, are projecting images or false apprehension onto the screen, which is mass psychological control. Therefore, the truth that this doctrine has revealed to us that we are divine beings and create our own universe is suppressed because then people would think for themselves and not buy into the mass consumerism and the degradation of the ecology and all that comes with it. If you extend that analogy, there's a lot to unpack there, right? Because yeah. who's, who's actually operating the projector, right? Who creates the content? It's being projected. In, in Plato's, <laughs> in Plato's motive, ideal, right? it would be the leaders of the Republic, the philosopher kings. Yeah. So it's up to us to actually try to lead the world and shine a light. Yes. But the philosopher kings at that time were initiates into the perceptive mysteries, and so were some of the philosophers, just like Pythagoras and Plato were. Yes. Some of the initiate kings were also ini initiated into the mysteries. They were, but they were also weary of democracy and the mass of people. But they were beneficent to the people at that time, regardless of what kind of rule existed. Some of the best, for instance, is Asoka, <coughs> who was very beneficent king. Uh, he didn't start that way, but once he understood what Buddhism stood for, that unity of life was a reality, then he change. So what I'm saying is that our society can change too, mm -hmm. if we were to kind of popularize these yes. ideas amongst the younger generation. And we're all parents, we're raising kids. Right. We can influence them in that direction. But what we must not do is have a set of rules in the household and another set in society. Yes. Because our kids normally say, but, well, there's no one out there to talk to about these uh, subjects. I feel totally isolated. Mm -hmm. So how do we cure that problem for the kids? When it is all materialistic and very competitive, the society would have been. We have to make, we have to make responsibility attractive to the youth. The Dutch people are very good at that, by the way. Their young ones are all involved in the movement. And uh, their motto is, give them something to do. Mm -hmm. so. Give them something to do. Also, learn to sit quietly and, and, and buy your soul. Uh, that's something that's really, I think, missing from the Western world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. Um, there are some schools in uh, England that are um, introducing silence and quietity like meditation into the classroom and these are really little toddlers they're teaching them like at three and four years old yes sanskrit mm -hmm. because they found out that you learn it a lot faster at that age than when you're six seven eight years old mindfulness mi amazing. mindfulness has mm -hmm. grown in popularity for the youth to be Absolutely. taught in schools yeah. um, we see we see intimations that well everything is commercialized in America like yoga started out as a as a as a pure practice mm -hmm. and it's not raja yoga the yoga of the mind but it's hatha yoga which tries to increase psychic abilities through physical means only mm -hmm. and uh, this is concerning since I was a long time practitioner of hatha yoga but there are intimations that society is changing for the better, at least, in its exercise practices, and becoming more aware of the mind-body connection. Just an example, uh, I recently heard, I, mean, I guess a couple of years ago, I heard about an initiative in our, in our cities of Baltimore schools, whereby uh, they don't do punishment. They send these students meditation mm -hmm. for a while. 
and to say that that was really having positive effect. Sounds like solitary confinement to me. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, they, they take you down to the, to the meditation room. They, well, solitary <laughs> confinement uh, in terms of being it being quiet, yeah, it is. <laughs> but this gives you a chance, gives you a chance to think about yeah. what you did. <laughs> so then the past when the uh, member of the tribe misbehaves, they'll send him in the forest to cool off. Right. To stay alone. Yeah, same concept. Yeah, same, same thing. concept. Yeah. Well, Sounds like we should have more initiation rites for the youth as well, into adulthood. Yeah. The idea of going into the woods mm -hmm. brought that to mind. Are there any more questions? Yeah, so this is all sort of, it sounds to me like if this is something we have to take, take in uh, and re realize that through knowledge and, cor you know, we can't really understand this mass through knowledge and correspondence she talks about a lot, we can get a lot uh, of knowledge through simple processes. And number one, number two, it just takes lifetimes to do this job, right? Yes, many metempsychoses and reincarnations. So how, do, how does that work? So the brain is set up to do this stuff, but mm -hmm. we have not used it in that way. So it takes a lot of unlearning to learn. Yes. Um, as Plato said, all learning is memory. It's there. We just have to burn off the dead wood and reawaken the truth. The analogy of fire is a good analogy for that. The fire of truth. Yes? But another key point in this philosophy is that regardless of how much you understand it, philosophically and mentally, if you do not practice it, mm -hmm. you will never know it. Right. Uh, so that has implications. In other words, all of the parameter paths that are listed that go in conjunction with the philosophy, plus Patanjali's yoga aphorisms, yes. med because you med mentioned meditation, Yes. and plus wherever it is that you learn, you have to put it in your daily life, practice it. Without practice, without self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. you will never walk that loss of your spend. Yes. Yes. I had a fascinating experience that I wanted to share in the context of the um, talk. I was doing volunteering and uh, the um, uh, it's listening to people who are having challenge right now. And the person was having a challenge, and I couldn't understand what the challenge is till we got to the bottom of it, because I couldn't understand. It was just wasn't making any sense. It's, there were some names and uh, fights, but it seems like these people didn't exist. And then the person said, well, I have this associative disorder, so all these mm -hmm. people are in me. Uh, there's a Ben, and there's Jane, and uh, the men and women all mixed together, and mm -hmm. there's like five of us and so such and such triggered such and such and now I have the headache and uh, and uh, this is just uh, I'm having a big bad day and I said listen I I'm listening to you but I can't relate to it because I have no idea what it is to be two people yes and I'm trying to relate but I it's very hard to understand and the person said and for me it's almost impossible to understand what it is to be one person because that's how we always were there was Jane, there was Jake, and there was Ben. Yes. And uh, I wish I could have that feeling of just feeling myself as one and not having all of this stress happening inside of me. And uh, I said, well, you know, how do you manage? He said, well, we try to negotiate. Every day we're trying to negotiate that, the, that this doesn't cause trouble and this doesn't get us into this and Ben doesn't quit the job. We, it's never-ending negotiation and trying to keep things at peace. And I said, well, it gives me an analogy. Maybe this is who we are all as human beings. Yes. You think you are such and such, and you're such and such, and we're all trying to negotiate, but what if we just suddenly realize we're one person? Uh, <laughs> it was very similar. Yeah. <laughs> because this individual is so much struggling understanding that I am just one. whatever. Yeah, that I, I'm whoever, whatever, John or Jane. There was all of that, and what if it's all of us doing this 
when it's actually one person on a more global level. If we identified with the yeah. one oversoul rather yeah. than the legion of eyes that the psychoanalysts discovered. Mm -hmm. The personality. Yeah. Yeah. But it's almost impossible because we're caught up in all of this. He did right. this, he did that, and I want this. And he is caught up in that within himself. Wow, yeah. sounds like chaos. <laughs> but it was very representative. Maybe I had to listen to the individual to understand unity, what we may not be understanding as a humanity. Yes, Josh. Um, along Thank along you. those lines, the, the, the way that it helps me to think about it is, um, well, we're often talking about that, you know, I as an individual have past lives and I will undoubtedly have future lives. And every other individual has past lives and future lives. But as we are all one, we really are incarnations of each other, right? Mm. We have multiple present lives yes. as well. They're not past lives, they're not future lives. They are still our other lives. Plato, Plato right. referred that to as spheres of existence. Right. That we have different spheres of existence, but we are just one. Yeah. We are one unity. Right. I don't remember the experience of my past life. Like, I don't know who that, right, consciously. I don't know who that was or, or what kind of experience. Just like I don't know who you are, what kind of experience you're having, mm -hmm. right? But we are no less one. Like, I'm no less one with my past life than I am with my other present lives. Um, having said that, there is a line of evolution that one carries from life to life to life. Um, and we kind of all come together at the end, I suppose, and we all came from the same source. And there are some paths that we take independently along the way. Mm. Um, but ultimately, it does refer back to the oneself of all. Yes. You, you, you touched on a Western philosophical problem called solipsism, the idea that we can't know another person's mind. But through this philosophy, we know that we are all one of one mind, and we are connected through that consciousness. Yes. <laughs> Considering what has been said, this must also be said, that each individual is a still an individual. I have an individuality that continues from life to life to life. Otherwise, I would not have an identity. Mm -hmm. That the triad mm -hmm. I'm talking about, the higher triad, right. goes from life to life to life and only retains the memory of each life that it is uh, similar to its nature. In other words, only your highest altruistic deeds, highest altruistic thoughts and uh, deeds are retained as a bead on the Sutratman, which is that silver thread that uh, they talk about in the Eastern philosophy. So even though we go through this life, all of it is not retained on that Sutratman because it's a spiritual uh, thread. It does not retain the physical aspect of life. It drops at the end of each life. The physical is important while we are on earth because this is how we gain experience. But where that entity is concerned, the individuality that has been from the beginning following each personality through every life, only what is similar to its nature can it retain. So uh, the, according to this philosophy, in each life we come and we perfect certain aspects of our life. That aspect is part of your knowledge base. But each human soul is going through similar experiences in their own lives and they are retaining what they have perfected for themselves. The skandhas that we have not quite done all that we could about is going to be our um, next life or the next one uh, goes three backwards and forwards um, to deal with. But what is important to remember is that as we are one over soul in our collectivity, so then every human soul's experience makes part of my experience. I think that is mm -hmm. what Josh was uh, referring to. So all and everyone's experience is recorded. Yes. Well, so if we it look becomes available to us. If we look at the orthodox conception of which Blavatsky was part and parcel from her culture, the conception of the Trinity is God. Even God has subpersonalities. So we have to we have to deal with this complexity, but we have to strive for 
even more and more unity of consciousness. She's not, not talking about God, she talks about gods. Gods, not one God. Because he, she says that just because Judea Christianity has made Yahweh or Jehovah one God, it does not make it so. That's the secret doctrine at the beginning. Yes. Over but, 30 but, pages. But the unmanifest is, is, is what we're... We don't think of, we don't think about the unmanifested as God mm -hmm. traditionally, but that's that unmanifested that evolves into to gods. And we think about God on a physical level, which is a, a dwarfing God, I think. There is no such concept yeah. as the anthropomorphic one. It's human-made right. idea. It, it, it does not have reality to it. And if we fool ourselves that that is reality, then we're not talking about the truth here. Any more questions? Uh, yes, I have two more. <laughs> <laughs> One is, yes, we develop uh, throughout, throughout our uh, personal efforts and so forth, we develop ourselves and perfect, and that's our individuality we talked about. But as we're doing that, we're having an impact on ourselves and everything around us. So then the skandhas come back to uh, gather with us for the next incarnation. Also, whatever we, my stinky personality has an effect on people around me too, as I'm trying to learn. So, you know, there's a million ways, a zillion of ways that we impact everything around us, and that's what we're here for to do that. The second is, HPV put those, those books out as, as a mouthpiece for the masters. And yes, there's not the detail in it, like she was thinking about putting out number three and four, which would be providing a tremendous amount of uh, detail uh, on the bones of this, uh, of what I, per I perceive it as the being bones. She's given us the skeleton. Uh, she, she brought the skeleton from the east Yes, in those books. as a visitor to those cultures. Right. Fundamentally, she was a Russian woman. Mm -hmm. And her authentic way of being in the world was that. But she was taught this through her understanding. Yes, she assimilated. By masters of wisdom. Yes. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll take a short break and then we'll reconvene for our continuation of our studies on the secret doctrine. We're studying.